Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. I'm Omar Garcia, Chief External Affairs Officer at the Port of Corpus Christi. On behalf of our Port Commissioners and CEO, Sean Strawbridge, we welcome you to a special lunch on a topic that is extremely relevant to our region. Before we get started, I would like to recognize all elected officials in the room, along with our Port Commissioners. Please stand and be recognized at this time. Expanding our existing water supply is something that is vital to the Coastal Bend's future, especially as we look to continue the phenomenal economic growth we have experienced over the last few years. By last count, we have over $65 billion in direct capital investment in our region, several thousand new jobs, and millions of dollars in economic benefits to local taxing entities. The Port of Corpus Christi remains committed to working with the City of Corpus Christi, neighboring communities, community leaders, stakeholders to develop an uninterruptible supply of water for the benefit of our region. The Coastal Bend has an opportunity to set a path forward for the rest of the state in addressing its growing water needs and doing so in a manner driven by scientific data and expertise. With the 88th legislature in session right now, the eyes of Austin, Texas are upon us and we must seize the opportunity to get this done today for our future growth, for our kids and their grandkids. Desal is the most important thing that we can work on to ensure further economic prosperity. Now to help me introduce our keynote speaker and get this program started, I'd like to welcome one of our distinguished port commissioners to the podium. Dr. Brian Gully, a retired oral surgeon, has a long professional and community-oriented career of service in the Coastal Bend. Commissioner Gully has worked with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Texas General Land Office, as well as serving on several boards. He currently serves on the University of Texas Marine Science Institute Advisory Board, the Island Strategic Action Committee, and the Island Moorings and the Channel Corporation Board. Commissioner Gully is a co-owner of Texas EMS Academy, which helps train first responders and has also completed a number of construction projects. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Brian Gully. Thank you for, thank you for that introduction, Omar. Um, I'll add a couple of things to what he said about the state of water in our situation before I bring on what I think is maybe one of the world's experts in desalinated water um, after 50, basically 50 years of experience. Um, I also serve on the executive board of the, of the EDC, the regional EDC, as well as the, the EDC in San Patricio County. And Commissioner Yardy over here and I, I think are the two, only two people that serve on, currently serve on both of those boards. So last week when we got a message from the city that they may not be able to guarantee water to future customers. It, it really hit everybody pretty hard and, we sh and it really comes to light the seriousness of our situation with water. Uh, the city has been working very hard on it. If you watch their meetings, you'll see that they almost, it seems like almost every meeting they're talking about their water situation and how we go forward. They're working on a, on a, on a desalinization plant. We're working on a desalinization plant. Uh, recently, I think December, we, we were the first, got the first discharge permit uh, for desalinated water, potable water, and that was ever given in the state of Texas. So this is, this is very important, and we're very much looking forward to working with the city. As you know, the city is the one that distributes all this water throughout this region. So we have a, a good location, we have a permit, we have, we're working on the final parts of that permit, and we're looking forward to working with the city and let them deal with this water and help them get the water to the customers. So we're excited about that and we see, we see help uh, on the horizon. So it's, it's very important today to be able to introduce Abraham Tenney. Um, he is, like I said, spent five decades working in the water, wastewater um, situation in Israel. Um, he, he currently works for, as a senior consultant 
for water, wastewater, and energy and desalinization for Luminaire Industrial Development Limited. Uh, prior to that, he was working with the, the, the country of Israel, which uh, controls all the water rights in Israel, uh, where he was in charge of the desalinization and wastewater there. Um, if you go to Israel and you drive down the road very far, you'll see miles and miles of banana plantations. And you, when you finally realize it's banana plantations, what are they doing in, a, in an arid area like this? It's because Israel knows how to deal with their water and their wastewater and how to conserve it. They don't have a lot of extra water, they have to take care of it. So he's been involved on this, and if you see a project in Israel in, in the last 30 years, it's probably got his handprints on it, as well as many in, in Europe uh, and other parts of the world, South and Central America. Um, he was overseeing, prior to working at Luminaires, he was, he was overseeing five extremely large uh, saltwater desalinization plants. I visited most of those plants, um, and it's, it's amazing to see. We're, we're actually, our ambitions are to bring a 50 million gallon a day saltwater desalinization plant. Doesn't have to start that big, but it can be scaled to that side and even doubled if necessary. To put that in context, the, the programs that he oversaw developing are, some of these things are over 160 million gallons a day. He also oversee, or had overseen the development of 33 other groundwater desalinization uh, projects. A total of 670 million gallons a day of, of water. And so what we're trying to do is, is pretty tiny compared to what they're doing in Israel and what they have to do in Israel but it's gonna become very, very necessary in the future to do this. So I'm looking forward to working with everybody in this region to bring this region water. So uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce you to Abraham Tenney. Um, his, he, I had the, 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 the lovely experience of having dinner with him last night with some of the people with the port and, and industry um, and his wife, Mahana, and um, give him a warm welcome. This is probably if I had to pick one, the, 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 the most distinguished expert in desalinated water that exists in the world today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you to the organizers for having me here and try to share with you what we achieved in Israel in the last few decades on the water issues. Uh, my name is Abraham Tene, and I used to be the chairman of the Water Desalination Administration of the Government of Israel. It means I was involved and responsible for all the desalination that was built in the last 30 years in Israel. Just to show you where we are and where the globe is going to, and you can see this red belt around the globe, which contains part of Asia, the north part of Africa, and the United States all together. And it means that all these areas are going to have less and less water in the future. And since the amount of water in the world is a fixed number, so these countries will have less water north to it and south to it. They will get more water. It means more floods, more water problems in the future. So things should be done. Things should be uh, planned to the future to be able to support our population with our needs. The Israeli Water Authority is a new governmental agency it's less than 20 years old, about 16 years old now. And one of the first things that this Water Authority took upon itself to do is really was written in few words to assure that water will be sustainable, available, reliable in the required quantities, locations, qualities, and I'll add to that in the right prices. You have to have the right price of water in order to be able to have a closed market a closed uh, water sector to be able to live on. Uh, just to show you where we are in Israel, 
And I apologize that all these numbers are in million of cubic meters per year and not in foot acre or acre fit that you like to do it in the United States. So usually, uh, these days, we are using about 2.4 billion cubic meter of water a year. This number grows up because the growth of population in Israel is about 2%. It's the largest growth of population in the Western developed countries. 2% a year, it means in 2050, we will double the number that we have today in Israel. It means we will reach about 16, 17, 18 million people in this region. Add to that also the Palestinians did supply water for them, and Jordan that we are also selling water to Jordan. So all together, we'll need to have much more water than that what we have today. The industry usually takes about 5% of the water. Agriculture takes about 50% of our water. And we need to give them what they need in order to be able to develop agriculture, not only food, but also cattle. Also, the livestock is very important. Without water, we have a huge problem with that. The main uh, uh, sector that is growing up is the urban sector. And this is really the one who is growing all the time in about 2%, as I mentioned. And these are the numbers of the demand. That means what we need in Israel regarding water. The big problem we have that from natural water, that means precipitation, we are getting only about 50% of it. And there is a huge gap between the demand and the resources. So we need to do many things all together in order to be able to close this gap between the demand and the resources. And uh, I'll come later on to one slide that gives all the story, but just to say that in order to be able to close this gap, we are doing three things in parallel. And to tell you that the story didn't start 30 years ago. 4,000 years ago, people of Israel came back from Egypt to Israel, went about 40 years in the desert, didn't have the good GPS that we have today, not Waze or Google Map, 40 years, and we had a wonderful uh, patent in order to get water whenever we need water. Moses, our leader, took a stick, eat the rock, and gets water. No environmental problems whatsoever. <laughs> no energy whatsoever but we don't have this stick anymore. And today, in order to get water, it, it takes a huge amount of planning, innovation, and all kind of other stuff in order to take seawater or salty groundwater and produce drinking water out of it. As I said, we are doing three major things in parallel. The first thing is water saving. And water saving, there are many things that we are doing where we call it water saving. I'll come to it in a minute. The other thing is water reuse. We take our wastewater. Our wastewater is a constant resource of water. You are cleaning this wastewater to a very good degree, and then you send it to the sea. We don't do that. We take the wastewater, we clean it, and use it back, mainly in agriculture. I'll come to it later on. And, but all of that is not enough. It's not enough in Israel to save water, to reuse water, and we need another resource of water. That's why we came into desalination in order to be able to close the gap that we do have. So going into water saving, there are several things. First of all is PR, media publications, to let the people know that we will never have enough water. In Texas, you will never have enough water. And you will always need to do all kinds of things in order to get the amount of water that is needed for the future, for your children, grandchildren, and next generation. Teaching the children at school, and these children, the elementary school children, the kindergarten children, we call them our water police. These are the children that are teaching their parents how to save water. 
close the tap when you're brushing your teeth, when you're shaving, don't clean your car with the horse but with a bucket, and etc., etc. things. And really these children are growing up later on to be adults that it's a way of life saving water. And you have to know that in Israel, while we are showering every day, we have a shower in Israel, still we are using about 50% of the water that you are using here in the United States. So there is a lot of things to do saving water. Then uh, water leakage in pipes. Water leakage in pipes is a huge problem. The piping system in most of the cities in the United States are old pipes. The pipes are underground. The leakage, you don't see it until it bursts from the road. It can take years of leakage that you don't know about it. Not only that, you don't measure your water. In Israel, every drop of water is measured. Every household has its water meter. Every wastewater has its water meter. It means we can close the mass balance of water. We know exactly what are we losing all the time. In the United States, you are trying to analyze in many ways what is the water leakage, but you really don't know, and the numbers are always twice or three times the numbers that the expert, the American expert, thought this is the situation. And in Israel, we succeeded to, to reach a point that all the water leakage all over Israel is less than 10%. If you take some small cities like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, etc., the water leakage is probably between 20 to 30%. Imagine how much water is lost and you cannot use it. Then the way we irrigate, as I told you, in Israel, we are using about 50% of our water for agriculture. In California, it's about 70% goes to agriculture. The way you irrigate is very important. I visited a few years ago uh, Arizona, went near the Colorado, and saw the farmers there just taking water from the Colorado in open channels and flood irrigation all over, the same as the Egyptian farmers are doing for centuries. It's wrong because most of the water is evaporated and doesn't reach the plantation. In order to do it, you have to go to the drip irrigation technology. It's done in the United States, but in a very low numbers. Drip irrigation saves more than 40% of the water you need for the farmers, for the agriculture industry. And the last thing I'll say about it is the water prices. Whenever you subsidize the water prices, people will not save water. Whenever people will pay the right price of water, and they know that if they will not save water, they will lose money, this is a strong factor. People know what to do if they are losing money. They will try to do whatever they can. So the water prices, the real water prices, is also very important. And all of that we call water saving. This is the first pillar that we are doing. The second pillar is what we call, you can see some publications. There is, by the way, a very interesting book written by Seth Siegel, an American uh, lawyer that wrote the book about what was done in Israel. Very interesting, appreciated. Uh, uh, it's a good book to read. Uh, the way uh, we are saving water by drip irrigation and some other things. You can see just a small patent how you can collect the vapors, condense the vapors during the night and get some water for your plantation without doing anything, without energy and anything. Uh, the way we allocate uh, water leakage, you don't need to dig the piping which are ground, underground, you just have software that can measure the flows and pressure of the water and get the exact location where you have a problem and go and fix it. And I already spoke about water tariffs. The prices in Israel, by the way, are between 
two and a half to three and a half dollar per uh, cubic meter of water. It includes also the wastewater treatment. These are the numbers that we are paying in Israel these days. And this slide is very important because it gives all story in one slide. You can see that until the early 90s, we were using only natural water, only water from groundwater and the lake uh, of Galilee, which is the one drinking water lake we have in Israel. But then we understood that we don't have enough water, and we started to reuse water. We start to collect our wastewater and send it to the farmers, mainly in the southern part of Israel, to start uh, using and reusing the wastewater. Uh, today, in 2020, 2022, we are reusing about 87% of our wastewater. 87%, we, 90% is the maximum we can reuse. The last 10% is sludge that you cannot take water out of it, and this sludge becomes compost later on. But 87 out of 90%, Israel is number one in the world with water reuse. The second countries that are reusing water in a larger amount, Singapore uh, from one side and uh, uh, Spain from the other side are now reaching about 30%, 3-0. Israel, 87% now. The United States, in, I heard that in Texas you are reusing about 10, 13%, which is the biggest probably in the United States. California is reusing about 10%. The total of the United States is reusing less than 1% of their wastewater. So imagine how much water you could send to the farmers and use it. And instead of using drinking water for the agriculture, take this drinking water to the cities and use reused water for agriculture. So this is uh, another thing. And the third thing I want to show you is what you see. Let me see if I can, sorry. I don't. You have some dotted line in the lower part. We chose the amount of precipitation during the years. And you see that until uh, 1995, the average precipitation was about 1.3 billion cubic meter a year that we are receiving from precipitation into our groundwater. It goes down. Today we are receiving only about 1.17 billion cubic meter per year. In 2050 we are going to receive only about 1 billion cubic meter per year of precipitation. It means we are getting less and less natural water in our land and take this together with the increase of population, you see that the gap is only growing all the time. So this is why we need to do things. And if uh, in the year of 2010, we were using almost 60% of uh, natural water, in 2050, we are going to use less than 30% of natural water. All the rest will be reused water and desalination. This is where we are aiming in Israel. Uh, I spoke about what you use, I'll not go too much into it because we don't have too much time, but all our large scale wastewater treatment plants in Israel are treating the wastewater and then it's sent to the farmers, to agriculture, all over Israel, all over Israel. Because we didn't have enough water and we don't have enough water in Israel, we developed a huge startup nation in the water industry. Not only in IT or computers, etc., that everybody knows about, but we developed a lot of things in the water industry. I'll just mention some of them. One of them is water security. Water security is not a matter of fighting against terrorism. It's fighting against nature uh, disasters like earthquakes, etc. When you have an earthquake, the first thing that is damaged 
is the water piping and the wastewater piping systems, and you don't have water and you don't have sanitation, and you need to deal with it. So we developed many software, hardware stuff in order to be able to deal with this kind of uh, water security. Smart cities. Smart cities is not only to measure the electricity that we are using at home, but also to measure the water, to be in a position that each and every landlord will know exactly how much water he is using online all the time and be able to control and do whatever he can do in order on that. And the last thing is really national water management. You have to understand that the United States doesn't have a water authority whatsoever. No water authority in the United States. You have the EPA that is dealing with water quality, but nobody deals with the amounts of water that people are allowed to throw from their own drills. If somebody takes out too much water, it influences the neighbor, it influences the other people. Somebody needs to deal with all of that. All the matter of water rights should be looked very carefully in the United States in order to be able to manage the water system. So this is another thing that uh, we developed many softwares and many experience dealing with water management all over Israel. But all of that was not enough, so we needed to go into producing new means, new means of uh, water and means to go to desalination. And we started with large-scale desalination only 20, 22 years ago. Until then, we had almost no desalination in Israel. So we started in parallel with brackish water desalination, small units all over Israel from the southern part to the north, taking groundwater, salty groundwater, and desalinate them for drinking water uh, uh, usage. And with brackish water, we are now, today, this is a slide from 2015, to date we are uh, desalinating about 80 million cubic meter a year from brackish water desalination. But the main resource of desalination is seawater desalination. We started the large scale desalination in 2000, the year of 2000, 20, 22 years ago. And uh, today we are reaching about 600 million cubic meter per year of seawater desalination in Israel. Add to that the 80 million of brackish water desalination, so we have about uh, seven, almost 700 million cubic meter of desalination, which close the gap for what we need until the next five to 10 years. We are okay with that, but looking into the future, we already started to construct a new desalination plant that will produce another 200 million cubic meter per year, and it will be in operation about one and a half years from now. And we are going to start next year another plant, number eight, that will produce about 100 million cubic meter per year. So altogether, we will reach almost one million, uh, sorry, one billion cubic meter per year of seawater and brackish water desalination for the next generations to come, but again, 10 years from now, we are going to build another one, and then another one, and until, until whenever we need. It means this is going to be an ongoing project all over Israel. Uh, to do that, of course, we need to have allocated areas where we can build the salination plots. Usually, the coastal area is very expensive. You want to have it, you want to have hotels, you want to have uh, houses there, we need to keep also place for desalination, so we have a master plan and we have a, a national plan that is allocating areas where we can build the, these kind of plans. And we, today, this master plan allocates areas for about 3 billion cubic meter per year. It means for the next 50, 60, 70 years, we are already allocated areas where we can be desalination. The prices, the prices are going down, the prices of desalination. We reached very low numbers, and today we reach numbers that are very close to 50 cents, 52 cents per cubic meter of desalinated water. This is what the government is paying now 
to desalination companies in order to have desalination. Uh, I'm not going into the quality, but desalinated water is as the best quality of water. No organics, no harmful minerals there, so it's very safe to use. Uh, of course, we do have in Israel a piping system that can bring water almost everywhere. The same as our blood veins in our body, we do have, you see the blue lines are lines that we can send water from south to north, from north to south, east to west, west to east, whatever. And then you see the right, the, the red, sorry, the red piping system, which is the reused water. We have another system, only for used water, that can send it also everywhere in Israel. Uh, of course, you need to do, to do that, you need energy, and in Israel we are uh, trying to have, uh, let's say, uh, clean energy or green energy, wind energy, solar energy, etc. and this is part of what we are doing. I'm not going too much into it, but all the energy we need for desalination it today is by uh, renewable energies in Israel. Uh, I'm not going too much into it. <coughs> wind turbines, I saw so many wind turbines uh, entering uh, Corpus Christi. We are not there yet, but we are going to build a farm of about 200 turbines in the northern part of Israel. And uh, of course, the environmental issues we are trying, first of all, to monitor what's going on in the sea after we are sending the brine back to the sea. For the time being, after 20 years of operation, we didn't find any problem in the sea sending the brine back. Usually, the influence is about two, three, four hundred meters where, from the point that the brine goes to the sea until the, the, until the concentration of the brine goes back to its natural concentration because of the huge dilution that you have in the sea. So you do sacrifice about a few hundred meters of the sea, but that's it. And you can give water to millions of people in the country. And just to show some picture, this is the first large-scale desalination plant in Ashkelon near Gaza Strip, producing today about 120 million cubic meters per year, working more than 20 years now. Uh, the second plant, the Palmachim plant, about 20 kilometers south of Tel Aviv, started as a 30 million cubic meter per year, producing today 90 million cubic meter per year. This is our smallest large-scale plant. It's still about 50% larger than the Carlsbad project near San Diego, which is the largest in the United States. So our smallest one is 50% larger than this one. And you have to understand that as much as the plant is bigger, the price of the water goes down. So try to get bigger plants in order to get a decrease in the water price. And then we have the Hadera plant, where part of the delegation that came to Israel saw this plant, about 130 million cubic meters per year. The Ashkelon plant and Hadera plant were the largest or the smallest plant in the world at that time. Then we have the Sorek plant, which is about 150 million cubic meter per year, and today it is the largest reverse osmosis desalination plants in operation in the world. And number five is Ashdod plant, about 100 million cubic meter per year. And just to add to that, that we are doing some work together with Palestinians and Jordan. We are trying to assist them with know-how, how to, with capacity building, how to build the salination plant, how to treat wastewater, how to reuse wastewater, and we are trying to have a kind of a mutual project between Israel and Jordan, and I hope something, sometime it will succeed, to take water from the Red Sea, which is the southern part of Israel, desalinate the water, send the water, most of it to Jordan, part of it to Israel, and send the brine to the Dead Sea in order to stop the decrease of the elevation of the Dead Sea. This is a wonderful project that I hope something will happen. That's it. So thank you. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>